gruesome lot. Happy Easter, or whichever seasonal festival you celebrate at this time of year. Basically means spring's on its way, so that's lovely. Like a bit of warmer weather and flowers growing and things like that. So I've had a request um, from a viewer to let them know what uh, each story is. What book it's from. So tonight's story is from Tales of Unease, edited by John Burke. And uh, it's called The Sound and the Silence. And it's by Darcy Nyland. And it's an odd one. It's not like a straightforward spooky ghost story. I like this one. The noise became a big wheel spinning, pounding, humming, roaring. There was the shock of crashing mountains in it and the pace of comets. There was an agony of terror. And then it seemed the house flew apart like flowers in a high wind. And then the noise was gone. And when he saw it was gone, he went over and sat on the bed and simpered. He folded his arms, the hands crushed underneath the armpits, and rocked back and forth, moaning a little. He sat there for a long time. When he got up, he stood for a moment, then walked to the door leading out of the bedroom, and suddenly on the threshold, turned his face in fear. But there was no need. He made a cautious noise in his throat and backed away down the hall. He went into the kitchen and took food from the cupboard, a mutton bone, and started to rest the meat off it. And he was tearing off the heel of a loaf when he stopped, listening, with the bread still in his mouth and the sweat of alarm on his forehead. He crept back along the hall towards the bedroom and standing pressed against the wall held the bread in his outstretched hand in the doorway. His mouth was open, waiting. But there was no sound. He stood square in the doorway and ate the bread and there was no sound. And he stared in wonderment and perplexity. Then he made sure. He cried out, I will take all the food in the house and eat it all. All the food I can put in my belly. I'll go outside too. Right out. And when he said these words, he waited in dread. But nothing happened. He made doubly sure. He went to the forbidden drawer and pulled out of it the guarded treasures the trinkets and the photographs and the doilies and flung them scattered on the floor and his heart was like a great bird in the cage of his chest as he watched and waited but nothing happened and slowly the little sounds came out of his throat and the light broke across his understanding gradually melting the last lingering shadows of his incredulity the noise was gone. Sitting there, thinking, his hands came into focus, and he lifted them up and turned them this way and that, but he didn't see the thick wrists, the padded palms, the hair bronze joints, the bird knuckles. He saw them as hollow gloves, and the noise had gone into them, he slapped them upturned and downturned on the bed and struck them against the wall, skinning them. And no noise came. And he knew the noise wasn't in them. He was full of joy. He went back to the kitchen and ate bread and butter and drank milk. He saw the packet of cigarettes on the shelf and took one for the first time in his life and struck a match to it. He puffed at the cigarette but held it away and scrutinised it with a, with a look of distaste. 
Then he thought there was pleasure in crushing it out. He held a lighted end in the saucer and pressed down and the cigarette bent and crumpled with a twist. He'd liked that. He lit all the cigarettes and put them out this way. He went into his little room and fell asleep on the stretcher. And he came out of sleep in the darkness and jumped up and ran to the door listening for footfalls. Pelting back and turning on the kitchen light and standing aghast at the dirt and neglect. He swiftly cleared the table, shoving dishes in the sink and putting on the tablecloth and pulling potatoes out of the vegetable box and hurrying to peel them. And then he remembered what he had remembered this morning. He went on with the tea, but didn't hurry. And there was a bright calm on his face. He ate the meal and defiantly left the dishes and went back to bed. He lay awake in the darkness and the creak of the house was strange in the darkness as the darkness was strange in the creak of the house. He knew the sound of the iron roof shrinking, the weatherboard stretching, the floorboards talking like mice among themselves. The tap dripped like a little mallet on glass, and the window across from him shrugged loosely in its frame. He knew all these things that had been with him a thousand nights, but tonight they were strange. He went to sleep when sleep took him like a drug, but he woke again in the darkness and sat bolt upright in terror. He jumped out of bed and ran through the house, putting on the lights. He was naked to the waist, the way he always slept, and the hair glinted redly on his chest, and was a tumbled shaggy flare on his head. His thick shoulders hunched as he stood there, with his long shadow up the wall like a wet stain on folded carpet. The slight currents of air touched and turned chill the sweat of his body, rising a little rough braille on his flesh. The noise was not gone out of that house. It was still in the house, hidden away somewhere in the silence. It was around. It waited unheard and watched unseen. It was with him. Like a man who walks in fear of coming upon an armed quarry, he crept through the house, listening. Listening with a strained alertness for its whereabouts. He was laired in that silence, and he sought clues from the silence. He looked up into the darkish corners of the roof, among the wisps of cobweb, bearded with dust, as if he might see it there and he scouted under the bed and behind the plain cheap wardrobe looking and listening and he went into the other bedroom but stood stock still when he saw the bicycle chain on the floor his teeth started to chatter and he ran out of the room slammed the door shut and was shivering then the silence was all around him as around a statue as he heard the wash of it in his ears he went into the kitchen and stared all around knowing it was looking at him and knowing that that he might surprise it grimacing from behind the tins on the top of the dresser leering from under the table sitting with cunning secrecy like a sniper on the broken light shade above his head. But he saw and heard nothing, and the rage came snarling out of his horror. And he, he wanted the silence to be shaped, shaped so that he could beat it into confessing the whereabouts of the noise. But there was no way he could handle it, and fright and horror strengthened in him. This was not like yesterday when the chains were broken 
and the house was no longer a barricade, and he dwelt on the pleasant instincts of freedom. He hadn't vanquished the noise, he'd only hidden it, and now he couldn't find it. And he feared its power, more than ever, because it was unseen and unexpectant. He fled into his room and shut the door and fell on the bed. In a little while, he heard another noise and he listened to it. The light slap of running feet, the clink of bottles on the veranda, the feet again and then silence. He put out the light and looked through the window. A misty man was running along the street in the dawn. He went and opened the front door, put his hand around and picked up the milk. He drank one bottle of it in a frightened way, as though trying to lure the sound out of its silence. He went back to his bedroom and lay there, tortured, and started moaning. At five o'clock in the evening, he heard footsteps crunching on the gravel walk, and wide-eyed, shaggy-headed, he ran down the hall and pulled the key out of the front door. A woman was framed in the keyhole, walking up to the keyhole, then a check wall against the keyhole. She knocked. He didn't move his head. His lip curled slightly. She knocked again, and then again. Yoo-hoo! Anyone home? Go away, he said, frightened by the voice. Is that you, Billy? the woman said, with a note of greeting in her voice. Where's your mother? Go away. I've got a message for her. Will you tell her I want to see her? He didn't answer. He saw the check wall move around in a circle, and the area enlarge as the woman walked to the edge of the veranda. Then it diminished again. Is she in? Go away. She's not sick or something, is she? He didn't answer. And she said sharply, with anger, The boss wants to know why she wasn't at work yesterday or today. Tell her I want to see her at once. Still, he didn't answer. And he heard the angry voice, as if she were pressing her mouth to the wood. If you don't answer me or do as I say, I'll tell her when I see her. And you know what that'll mean for you, don't you? Are you going to answer my questions? She waited. And he waited. And she said, All right, my lad. And he watched her shrink in the keyhole again. Halfway down the path, she turned her white, wrinkled face and looked back. He saw her thin mouth and squinted eyes. He watched her go through the gate and past the keyhole. And suddenly he felt the exhaustion of the day's search and the day's vigilance. He felt the weakness in his bowels, a sick emptiness. And he cringed away from the conqueror, the noiseless noise sheltering in the stillness, hiding in the silence. And he was crying his submissiveness, cowering, and mouthing his obedience, saying, I will be good. I will be good. I won't steal no more food when you're away. I won't answer no doors. I'll keep inside. And he started sobbing, in a terrible fright of contrition, slobbering in his hands and rocking his head wildly. And then slowly... He stopped. He kept very quiet. He sat very still. As if a light had poured into his brain, he knew where the noise was. He knew where it was. And he knew why it wouldn't start. Because the words had to start it. The words had to start it 
and the words had to leave off being words and become only sound and the sound built fast and heavy and became the big wheel spinning, roaring like the whirl of atoms and terrible in its velocity. He ran into the bedroom and fell down where the noise was cooped. There, he thought, it was cooped. And where he had to prove it was cooped, so by proving it to be there, he would prove it to be nowhere else. He punched and tugged and pulled and slapped, shouting, Idiot! Beast! Say the words! Say them! Say them! But the silence was only the more clam-lipped. And deeper from the sound from himself. His screeching voice, his harsh panting. The fleshy cuffings of his hands. The bumping of the head on the floor. Say them, say them. Thief, liar, sneak. And all the words, say them. He shrieked, take the chain and beat me and say them. He was weeping, screaming. But the deaf don't hear. And the mute don't speak. And the dead are deaf and mute. And then he saw, all of a sudden, the black shiny boot, the blue surge, and he shot his head up wildly and the policeman was staring down at him at his crumpled face the grey hair in his clutching hands and the heavy masculine woman with the frozen snarl whose body he sat astride and that's your lot for Easter Sunday thought I'd do something joyous and happy for Easter yay well, I hope you're all doing well and I hope you're all staying safe. And uh, thank you for watching, guys. And I will see you, Grim Lot, next Sunday for more strange and unusual stories. <laughs>